Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another Tech Online Masterclass. Today we are thrilled to have um, San Francisco based artist producer Grimecraft with us. Uh, he has a background in rock music um, uh, from way back, but now he is really a, a renowned DJ of video game music. He's a pioneer in the virtual music space. Um, has a background in game development as well. Um, so he, he began live streaming virtual concerts on emerging, emerging platforms back in 2012. Um, now in 2020, he's using platforms like Twitch um, and connecting audiences to new, new kinds of music uh, in virtual spaces. Uh, he's evolved, evolved genre movements um, and done work with uh, Future Base uh, and um, kind of collaborated with the Flaming Lips on Disney's Fantasia. Um, worked with the Glitch Mob, Toki Monster, and Rez, um, and is uh, one of the kind of originators working in the Wave VR. So we're super uh, excited to have him here today to to join us and talk about where this space is evolving. Uh, hey, Clark. Hey, uh, thanks for the cool intro, <laughs> and thanks for having me. Of course, um, this is the first time I've I've done a talk over Zoom, but uh, it's, let's see how it goes. Um, I want to thank you guys all for for coming and checking this out. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll uh, get started here. Um, also, feel free. This isn't like an open forum, so if you have any questions or whatever, I'm reading the chat. So I, I feel free to ask whenever, and maybe I'll cover it when I'm talking about something. Anyways, uh, hi, my name is Clark Nordhauser, but most people know me as Grimecraft. Um, I'm an artist, producer, and creative in the music and gaming industries. Uh, go through a quick resume so you know I'm legit. Um, I've worked at a few game studios like Insomniac Games, Harmonix, Mu blah, 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 Harmonix Music Systems, and uh, Crystal Dynamics. I'm also one of the founding members of uh, Wave, uh, previously known as the Wave VR, um, and also an A&R for independent video game licensing record label Game Chops. Um, I would say uh, my expertise is in creating platforms for people love music and building brands, uh, as well as uh, creative directing music uh, projects. Um, I've operated within the games and music industries uh, since 2010. Uh, I guess I have another resume slide. This is a couple of companies I've uh, worked with over the years um, as either promotional partners for activations or, um, you know, directly working with them uh, on contract um, stuff. I've done a lot of stuff with Twitch, Sony, Intel, Spotify, Sega, Disney, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, I'm gonna talk about my path into being one of the earliest innovators and influencers in the virtual music space. Um, so my approach has kind of been tying and, and bridging the worlds of music, gaming, and live events. Um, that kind of starts with uh, me, loving music from a young age. I've been playing instruments my entire life and creating music for over 20 years. I've been producing and DJing and touring as Grimecraft since 2012. Um, I've worked on creative teams to develop games. I have a strong background in 3D art and creative direction, uh, produced tons of live events and parties and activations, booked independent tours, uh, and created virtual spaces, not unlike this one. Um, I've done marketing and artist management and a lot of things that are kind of in the pipeline in the music industry. Uh, I consider myself more of a background um, behind the scenes person in the music industry, though I you know, am an artist myself. Um, so I'm gonna cover a lot of things uh, in this talk, but overall it's gonna be kind of like how I bridge the gap um, between three these three industries to create a unique creative career that's uh, provided me with the financial freedom to kind of do whatever I want and take on projects that that I care about. Um, it kind of, this talk is kind of coming out of a really interesting time um, because we're in this weird um, you know quarantine crisis right now where we're basically seeing the collapse of event driven marketing as we know it and seeing a rapid shift to virtual events. Um, so hopefully you guys can learn from this and uh, help. it'll help you move forward with how you want to approach your um, path in music. Um, so I feel like uh, to fully understand the intersection of these things in the modern era, um, 
it's important to to discuss uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, you know, streaming music, live stream concerts, etc. I'm going to go through a bit of a history for anybody um, who may not be uh, an 80s child like me. So if you know about all this stuff coming up, then sorry, but you know, I'll try to make it fun. Um, anyways, uh, I think a lot of uh, our current uh, state in, in the music industry started in the early 2000s. Um, this was a time when the internet was really starting to gain stride and, and people were just starting to connect with each other um, online. Uh, it, it also marked the beginning of a transformation for the music industry as a whole, uh, digital music specifically, uh, the new frontier, uh, most notably the MP3. Um, I don't know if any of you guys owned an iPad, iPod back in the day, but uh, that was like a lot of the way ways we were consuming music uh mobily and um you know eventually that evolved into what we all have today and iphone etc and it was an interesting time um lots of things that really uh changed the landscape the internet uh helped it it was uh people were just starting to connect and using social apps like like myspace and chat apps like msn aim um Social gaming was was just starting to begin. Uh, things like Neopets um, and web-based uh, applications connect people. Um, and the internet really presented a lot of new opportunities for people, uh, as well as new challenges, uh, specifically uh, for the music industry. Um, if anyone remembers platforms like Kazaa and Napster and LimeWire, peer-to-peer uh, -peer platforms, which almost destroyed the music industry. Um, so the the record industry uh, was pretty much at war with music piracy for the first um, for the early two thousands. Um, people were able to share music and, and download music for free on, on these platforms, and uh, it kind of changed the way. The music industry evolved like no longer were people uh buying records but um they're just downloading music illegally um and sending it to each other with these peer-to-peer -peer services um so ria uh which is the recording industry association of america basically sued all of these companies for tons and tons of money and try to shut it down um napster being you know the, the first famous one as a uh, dr dre uh, famously said, fuck Napster. <laughs> um, you know, that was uh, a really pivotal moment for for a large artists and, and the divide between uh, people uh, consuming music and, and getting paid for music. Uh, Rhea actually sued LimeWire, which was kind of the, the later lasting peer to peer services for $72 trillion in damages to the music industry, um, which is absurd because that's like um I, I don't think that much money even existed <laughs> in in the year uh 2006 or 2005 when that when that happened luckily they settled for about one 105 million which is still a pretty <laughs> substantial amount of money for that time um anyways this was the first major uh disruption for the music industry um and changed the way uh the record industry um, approach music and you know it's the reason we see uh, streaming now and uh, it's interesting just because this is how music has evolved into streaming like over time uh, the record industry evolved with piracy um, um, of course those services didn't really take stride till the 2010s um, you know things like Spotify and SoundCloud and Apple Music and the music industry and, and the music streaming that we know today, uh, those things uh, were a direct result of, of music pirating. Um, and honestly, uh, it, it's it's a nice balance. It's like, oh, pay a subscription fee and get all the music you want. It's actually a pretty good deal for the consumer, at least. Um, on the artist end, it kind of sucks. <laughs> but um, that's why it's more important than ever to have your audience and, and make merchandise and, and have those kind of opportunities, sell hard tickets or whatever, things that 
are, are starting to disappear for a lot of artists. Um, anyways, I was, you know, growing up in this era, playing rock music, um, releasing music on pure volume in MySpace and things that don't exist anymore at the same capacity. Um, but the early 2000s really uh, inspired a lot of my thinking and, and a lot of like what made me into the person I am today and, and uh, brought me a lot of the ideas that helps me uh, create a lot of the things I, I've created in my professional career. Um, I wanted to cover something that's really interesting to me, uh, an early online virtual music platform um, called Coke Music. Uh, it was probably one of my earliest obsessions in life. Um, well, chat rooms in general, avatar-based chat rooms, the ability to hang out on the internet with people and have your own avatar and stuff. Um, I was, you know, playing a lot of Fantasy Star Online in this game in conjunction with each other and, and connecting with people uh, in these like avatar-based worlds. So if, I, I doubt a lot of people know what Coke music is, but it was something incredibly ahead of its time. Um, yeah, huge blast from the past. Um, so for everyone who doesn't know, uh, Coke Music was a branded virtual world targeted to teens globally. Users created their avatar through a choice of looks and styles. On entry, uh, denizens were granted their own set of studios to create and spin their own custom mixes. Um, an economy centered around the accumulation of decibels earned by favorable DJ mix reviews, um, as well as virtual Coke consumption. Uh, decibels were spent to populate your pad and furniture and other items. At its height, Coke Studios had over a million page views a day with an average growth of 200,000 unique visitors per month. And the average visits lasting more than 25 minutes, which is amazing retention. I know I'd spend hours and hours and hours playing this game. It was the third most popular teen website in 2004. Um, to anyone looking at this right now, you might think it looks a bit familiar. Um, maybe like Animal Crossing or something like that, where you're creating your room. Um, this was really um, impactful. I uh, It changed my life and um, it kind of set me on the direction and in the path that where I am now as a, as a record producer and artist and a DJ and stuff. Um, I would also say it was my first DAW. Um, this DAW that was in this game where you create your demo and then play it out to people like, wow, <laughs> I didn't realize like this is the kind of thing I'd be doing the rest of my life then, but it, it shifted my view on not just playing rock music, but you know, making trap bangers on <laughs> Coke music in 2001. Um, it was super ahead of its time. Um, you had an inventory uh, with the ability to print CDs to give to other players. Uh, your avatar had a chat range. So it was like early spatial audio, but for text. Like if you were far away from somebody, you wouldn't be able to hear them. Um, like this bold text here on, on uh, here. If, if you're on stage playing a song, like everyone can hear you in the room. But if you're far away, it's like a little, you know, it's little dots between it and stuff. Super cool. Um, there's an online catalog of items, including branding content. Um, they did branded deals with, with Shark Tale and <laughs> American Idol, things like that. Basically, um, it uh, kind of gave me an introduction to concepts that uh, made me want to create this kind of thing, uh, games, music, and tech, uh, and deep seated these these ideas into my mind, which helped me build what. I'm probably most known for, which is a music platform called Wave. Um, unfortunately, Coke Music shut down in 2007. Um, wait, I mean, I wish it still existed now. If it could exist right now, I would be playing it. And I probably wouldn't be productive at all because my music career would just exist in Coke Music. And <laughs> I would continue making silly, silly bangers out of, of presets here. Anyway, something that followed that, which was also super important, is a site called Turntable FM. Uh, this didn't launch till 2011. 
Uh, but Turntable FM was a social media website that allowed users to interactively share music. Um, it combined music streaming, chat rooms, and voting, and simulated a virtual environment filled by audience members and DJs represented by player avatars. Um, when I first entered the gaming industry, this was the primary way I was uh, consuming music with friends. Uh, we'd all join a room and you know, you you get on stage and, and play a song and then it goes to the next DJ and they play a song. Basically, it was real time collaborative playlist making. Um, also super ahead of its time um, and super fun. It, while, you know, it was similar concept to Coke music, uh, it was more about playing music um, off like SoundCloud or uploading your own music. But um, people were receiving royalties for this. So unfortunately, this. this also shut down. Um, anyways, that's where my head was at in 2010. Um, 2011, sorry, 2011. Uh, it's also when I first entered the gaming industry and was working as an artist. Uh, I actually went to school for art, uh, at Ringling College of Art and Design. So my background, um, my educational background is, is in 3D art, game art, design. Um, so I, uh, one of the first major projects I worked on um, is Disney's Fantasia Music Vault. Uh, this was a Kinect music game that I worked on at Harmonix. Um, basically, you were able to remix music with your body. Uh, this is the trailer for it, um, which doesn't show any gameplay, but kind of gives you the idea of the kinds of things you're using gestural movement to bring in tracks and, and do live remixing. It was super cool and um, unfortunately it didn't sell very well uh, and it was marketed terribly, but it um, kind of had a lot of concepts in there that also helped build Wave, not to mention half the team that worked on this game are the people that co-founded Wave. So um, it wouldn't be till you know five years later that we'd get together and, and make something like that. But oh God, this is such a silly scene. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was a really cool experience working at a gaming studio that was music centric. Um, I learned a lot there about you know making games, working on an independent budget, having to work with publishers, artists um, and try to make something awesome. God, 2013 is when that finally shipped on the Xbox One. Right after they pulled the <laughs> Connect from the Xbox One, they kind of like screwed us over heavy. But uh, yeah, that was a good time. Um, and it was a really cool product. And that, that's when I got to work with the Flaming Lips and, and make a song with them, uh, a remix of Yoshimi Battles of Pink Robots, if anyone's familiar with that. Anyways, uh, after that, I ended up leaving and moving out here to San Francisco and um, working on the Tomb Raider franchise for a little bit before deciding to just quit the game industry because it wasn't it didn't feel right for me. And at that time, music, my music career was was starting to like kind of gain traction. And it seemed like the right thing to do to just quit and uh, focus on my music full time and, and focus on uh creating my own brand and, and working for myself so um in late 2013 i i left my job and headlined a festival called magfest and just started uh going from there so i also started experimenting in live streaming um the you know pre-twitch live streaming um the picture shown is from a website called Tiny Chat, which uh, is not unlike Zoom, um, but we were throwing concerts on this by having two users, one person running visuals and one person with the audio. It had the worst sound quality you could ever imagine and uh, was very, very ghetto. <laughs> but um, it was kind of my introduction to what was possible. Um, so, uh, yeah, tiny chat. Wow. I also started 
experimenting with a platform called Mixify. Um, wow, that's the lowest res image I've ever gotten. Um, <laughs> Mixify is kind of like the evolution of Turntable FM, um, but has a live streaming element. Uh, so this is from my friend DJ Cutman, who who do a weekly show on there, and we both kind of do shows on there and, and uh, try to reach as many people as possible. Um, eventually, I gravitated towards a platform called Justin TV, which had just rebranded to the name you guys all know, which is Twitch. Um, so Twitch was a music, or was not a music platform. Um, and they partnered with uh, people like me and DJ Cutman and Darude and Deadmau5 to create the early Twitch music. So we were the first people doing non-gaming content on their gaming platform. Um, and this was around 2014, 2015. Um, so <laughs> creating music on this platform was hard. There wasn't like categories then. It was mostly gaming. And if you weren't doing gaming content, uh, you still had to be in a gaming category. So I'd always stream music under the Minecraft category because I'm Grimecraft. <laughs> it made sense to me. Um, and it worked out. Uh, you know, 2000, 2000, 2014 and 2015 was a huge time for Twitch to establish their market dominance in this space. Um, and, you know, as you know, that they are the top uh, music or streaming, live streaming platform. Uh, I created um, a weekly broadcast on Twitch after partnering with them that featured a a live interactive music visualizer. Um, and I'd bring in a guest every week from around the world, usually somebody on tour or somebody who was coming through town to uh, play the show um, and do live visuals for them. So that was not like something people had ever seen on Twitch at the time. Um, and somehow I kept up with doing this weekly for years um, while touring. Um, I did multiple shows from overseas, uh, just kept it going every Sunday, 7 p.m. As I, you know, I, I actually still stream now, not Sundays at 7 p.m., but Tuesdays. You know, you have to stay on a schedule. It's 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 part of the job. Um, after gaining a lot of traction with this, uh, I was hit up by a former coworker, Adam Arigo, uh, who had an interesting demo to show me in VR that had something to do with music. Um, and that sounded interesting. And my life really <laughs> changed at that point. Uh, and that was the beginning of the Wave VR, now known as Wave. <clears throat> so at the end of 2015, I was um, in a Slack channel for the first time with these dudes. And uh, this is the original team, uh, just a couple guys with a prototype and a Slack channel. Um, So the early prototype and, and demo I was shown was nothing like the product that I would end up designing, but uh, it was a music creation tool, um, kind of like a mini DAW in VR. So you were able to interact with the step sequencer, uh, some synths, pads, uh, effects, and uh, create little songs. It was pretty cool. Um, it was definitely... Uh, something that was easy to show to people um, and easy to uh, digest. I thought uh, it could be cooler than that. Um, but, you know, this was still a, a cool product and obviously this never made it to market, but there were some cool things done with it. This was a mixed reality performance with that demo where uh, Aaron is in VR playing the pads and creating a song while Finn is there playing guitar and jamming with him. Just watch this for a moment. <laughs> Just 
So that's him like interacting with the uh, sequencer and building out a beat. <laughs> this is so silly. Look back at. <laughs> Anyways, while this was what I was shown, um, I just thought it was super compelling and the potential was huge um, and started designing something that I felt could be even bigger. Um, and to me, that was being able to DJ in virtual reality and have real other people in virtual reality from anywhere in the world come watch that DJ set and create a virtual environment for uh, EDM shows. Um, so this is some concept art, some early concept art of, of what you know it eventually became. Um, but I, I thought the potential was huge, like being able to reach your audience from anywhere in the world and, and join them and, and be co-present with them in virtual reality, be able to interact with your favorite artists. You could help so many people, you know, at the time, you know, people who didn't want to tour anymore could reach, you know, anyone from all over the world. They just couldn't stop touring and, and okay, I do all my shows in VR. Your ticket is here. You know, you can reach it from anywhere in the world. And um, I thought that was super cool. We had the idea to um, also do clearly branded events with artists. So this is some concept art made for Skrillex um, that was never used. Uh, we never ended up doing the Skrillex show, but it, um, pretty sweet. Could have been really cool. Uh, this is what it looked like um, at the beginning. It you know kind of looks like Nintendo sixty four graphics. Uh, it's a prototype. But uh, that's, you know, has one-to-one -one tracking. My avatar is just a head and, and some hands, but you can change how the world evolves. So the DJ could VJ and, and affect the music at the same time. Uh, it was pretty primitive. Um, the DJ decks were pretty much put together in a day. There were some EQ effects and uh, the tracks would sync to a master clock. So it's kind of like an able, playing an Ableton set. Um, and then these effects cubes at the side would uh, also affect the visuals. Um, this is a video from DJ Tech Tools. They did an interview with me in 2015. But yeah, there I am like throwing in a track to the then deck, which is just a cube, and playing a song. Let's see if the volume comes on. I can adjust anything, you know, do some filter action. They use some effects for the drop. And I have the ability to VJ and DJ at the same time, so at the drop for any key moments, I probably want to change how I look, right? <laughs> so it's been about... Okay, anyways. Um... This was pre-funding. This was pre-making money, having a salary. This was still like five guys trying to disrupt and, and make something that was really going to you know, overhaul the music industry. So as you would as an artist, you know, you make the album and then you go on tour and you go back to the studio and make a new album. So the next thing was to you know, kind of go on tour with the concept. So the first thing we did was um, what I would refer to as the blind disco. Um, and this was something we brought to VRLA and E3 and GDC. Basically, um, I would <laughs> DJ a show in VR. We'd give people mobile headsets to um, be a part of the virtual audience and see the show from VR. Um, so... <laughs> Looked really silly, you know, seeing this screenshot makes me laugh these days, but you know, I, I can't see anybody in the real crowd, <laughs> but everyone seems to be having a good time. Um, we uh, 
built out this big sponsored activation for uh, VRLA, which is kind of one of the coolest things we did in the early days. Um, so it was sponsored by Skull Candy and Subpack and 3D Live. Uh, and this is the thing with the um, mobile headsets where people, you know, would be in this real environment, put on a mobile headset and then see the virtual environment and see me in virtual reality DJing. And of course, like I'd be there on stage, not able to see any of the real people, but I'd be able to see the avatars of the real people uh, attract in one one space. So it was really interesting. Um, it was an effective demo that really um, helped us gain a lot of traction and meet a lot of cool people like Reggie Watts and meet a lot of investors and meet a lot of people who would help us out and, and help us build this company into something that uh, was viable for uh, the future. Here's just some more images of, of that experience. <laughs> oh yeah, and then uh, I've totally forgot about this. So 3D Live um, is this company that, that does these uh, th like stereoscopic 3D uh, visual walls. So everyone who wasn't in VR got a pair of 3D glasses and the visuals on the wall would like pop out at them. So even if you weren't in VR, you had like a cool experience. Um, so th this is a video of bringing this concept to E3. We did a party, uh, with upload VR at, um, a big venue called exchange in LA. Um, and I, I was on stage, not be able to see the real crowd, but there was people networked from all over the world that I could see. So I, I was like interacting with a virtual crowd while, you know, people in real life are having the time of their lives. And, you know, at this point it still kind of looked like shit, um, but it was a really interesting concept. We projected all those visuals like on the, the LED screens behind me and stuff. It was super cool. Also a like technical nightmare. <laughs> to set up um, and have the, the VR base stations like keep tracking on me while you know a bunch of lasers and lights and fog are going off. It, it was it was insane um, and not something that was viable for the long run. Clearly, <sighs> yeah. God, going through my history here. So right after this, I guess that was the end of the tour, so to speak, and and. Um, me and Adam had started uh, funding the company and and, and uh, funding a music startup, which is not easy. <laughs> it's not uh, easy for people to give you money for an industry that is is mostly like set and set in some very old ways. And uh, you know, one of our goals was to disrupt the music industry. Um, and you know change the way people experience music and change the way uh, fans interact with artists and, and uh, you know, cut out the middleman, essentially. Like, you don't need a promoter. Like, you don't need a booking agent. You can just throw all your own shows. We wanted to democratize music, essentially. Um, so <laughs> I don't think you'll meet many people who will tell you that they turned down an acquisition from Google, but... Uh, I will be that one person you know in life who will tell you that. Uh, probably, I don't think it was a mistake. They did not uh, give us nearly enough money. But um, yeah, that, that was one of the first major life decisions with this company that was made um, to not be acquired and, and go with venture capitalist funding. Um, oh, shit. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we ended up um, having a lead investor, Kleiner Perkins, uh, which is a, a big investor who, you know, led our, our first round of funding, our seed round um, for 2.5 million in 2016. Um, and yeah, I mean, this era of my life kind of felt like, uh, if anyone has seen the show, Silicon Valley. Um, it was basically season one of Silicon Valley. That's what my life felt like, like going, going on to all these, uh, into all these investor offices, 
carrying a giant computer and a bunch of VR stuff and trying to keep the attention of some douche on his phone. Man, what a time. And just like Silicon Valley, um, I was also uh, chosen to speak in the startup showcase at TechCrunch Disrupt. <laughs> so uh, a lot of funny parallels there. I was obsessed with that show um, just because it was so relevant to my life at the time. And it just felt like it was, a you know, that was happening. Everything like it also just helped me understand this crazy world I was getting into of, uh, you know, courting VCs and, and trying to like, you know, be good with everybody, keep a company running, pay people as little as possible, bootstrap as long as possible. Um, yeah, it all got really complicated and all got really uh, crazy. So I think every story like this has like a, you know, the money, the drugs, the fame, blah, blah, blah. I would say this is, this was that time in my life. Um, I was, you know, rubbing shoulders with, with a lot of my heroes. Um, suddenly I was walking into meetings at a Scooter Braun's office and, you know, passing Pharrell and shit and hanging out with Steve Duda and, and Zed and Skrillex. I was DJing Notch's mansion parties every weekend in LA. Um, for networking or, you know, being a part of the industry, being part of LA, being part of where the money and the music industry and where the investment and the interest lies. Um, but meeting all these people and, and, you know, being around all these people is really important. And I definitely developed a lot of lasting relationships uh, through this time in my life. But uh, it, it was crazy, you know, um, giving demos to my heroes and, uh, you know, having them say it was cool and it was a cool idea and having them know who I was, it, it you know, felt weird. Um, and man, like getting involved with these sorts of people, um, you just know, you get to understand like how crazy their lives are and how weird their circles are. And it's something that like, you just gotta, gotta take a step back from because, you know, every star that I've ever known has just a weird thing going on with, with their people. And it's just, it, it's, it's weird. So stepping out of that part of my life it felt great. I, you know, I, I feel much better not being in the fast pace uh, music industry, you know, hang out with Skrillex and shit. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was like 2016, 2017. And that era kind of ended and we had our funding and, and started building a company in Austin, Texas. And um for the cheapest overhead possible. Obviously, we weren't going to open a studio in San Francisco and burn out of all of our um, VC money. So it was a smart decision. And we still have that office in, in Austin, Texas. So at this point, um, building the platform itself was, was kind of the main focus. And a lot of um, those things that I talked about earlier from the early 2000s were, were what influenced me to uh, like think of these concepts and, and, and kind of like build around like what made those things popular and, and you know why those experiences were engaging and fun. Um, so with the help of this funding, obviously we could expand the vision to, to do more of those things and, and make it more of like a platform in, instead of it's like, oh, you can DJ in virtual reality. So the plan was not to create a virtual concert, but a social platform um, for music. And uh, we needed like a, a social hub. Um, we wanted to create something um, similar to a festival experience, but in virtual reality. A festival that you can put on your headset and experience from anywhere in the world. So it's like the musical metaverse as, as um, describe it. Uh, yeah, so building out, um, we basically built like almost like a playa, um, if anyone's familiar with Burning Man, um, which was, you know, we called it the expanse and it was a social hub where, you know, there's a bunch of art installations. There was a bunch of uh, stuff you can interact with. There was a bunch of crazy, um, things you could do with people. Um, you could give each other virtual drugs, uh, which we called social trips, um, where you interact with another user, you both press the trigger at the same time, and suddenly your your vision has changed, and butterflies are flying everywhere. Uh, so we thought of like all the things that like make uh, music festivals special, and and kind of recreated that experience for virtual reality. 
as well as give, gave people the um, ability to have their own spaces, which are called home caves, um, where they could, you know, build their own parties and have their own parties and, and meet with people in private. Um, so with all those concepts, we uh, launched um, beta for this in, in 2017, in April. Uh, for the launch of this, I actually uh, performed in Austin with people in VR from all over the world, kind of like that E3 show from way back, but um, <laughs> at a more stable frame rate and uh, a product that looked looked way better and, and was way better. So um, people who weren't able to attend this party at the uh, Reddit Twitch house at South by Southwest, where we had the party, um, were able to experience the show in virtual reality, which is, you know, kind of the main point. It's like the, the thing we want to build, build a virtual concert that people can attend from all over the world. That's a little more immersive than, than just a live stream. Um, our launch in progress was covered by many outlets and, um, you know, that was awesome, you know, seeing your name in, in Forbes and, and Vice and, you know, all these these websites and blogs and magazines that I read all the time. <clears throat> so after launching in beta, um, one of the most important things uh, we thought to build was um, a way for users to bring their own content into the platform and um, create their own parties. So uh, this is something called, we called the wave builder. Um, and in people's private spaces, the home caves, uh, they were able to bring in assets from different VR apps like Tilt Brush um, or just 3D models from the web and their own computers. Uh, we partnered with Google to, um, to build this and have a database from Google Poly so people could upload um, anything they wanted to and, and bring it into their scene to, to make uh, whatever they wanted, really. Um, and while, you know, it's directed at, at creating your own stage and, and rave, um, users made all sorts of shit that you couldn't even imagine. I've seen roller coaster rides. I've seen like murder mystery things I've seen games like entire things that you never thought would build so never <laughs> never underestimate um, your community and the people that actually use your platform because you know those are the most creative people and the people that really care about that are going to build incredible things that you're never going to see um, anywhere else so th these are just some screenshots of, of some user creations um, that we've seen um, I think I have a video yeah this is from the other weekend our users through a festival called Groundswell, which um, I think this is the third one they've thrown. But uh, this is just an example of, of the kind of stages that they're building in VR. Incredible, honestly, um, especially with the, with the tools we've, we've given them. It's like, wow, this is really <laughs> sweet. Kind of a question about uh, what some of these tools consist of that uh, users are using to make some of this, these assets. Yeah, so um, the Wave Builder is um, an in-game uh, tool, which um, it pulls from a database. Uh, Google Poly is the database that it pulls from. Um, but you can bring anything from Tilt Brush or your 3D modeling software. Um, and then you basically pull those assets out of that database and place them in your scene as you would like in the Sims or something. There's like a grid. Uh, you can turn the grid off if you want, but it's a little finicky, but basically, you know, you can make your world really big or really small and, and start placing stuff and move around, carry something. It's like a VR version of, of the Animal Crossing builder <laughs> i keep bringing things back to animal crossing because i'm obsessed with animal crossing right now but um i hope that answers your question 
is there is there like an arbitrary um, size constraint, or is you kind of it sounded yeah, like you can kind of make it as big or as small as you want? There's um, there's memory constraints, so you can't have too many assets that um, take up a lot of memory, or else um, the game won't let you do it. So basically, if you have a bunch of assets that um, are small or uh, you know aren't using crazy shaders or animated materials and stuff, you can make giant stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff in this video is is, is pretty impressive and and giant. Uh, and yeah, there's no limit to like how big you can make your space. Um, and you know, users were hacking and getting around it to build compelling experiences that we could have never even imagined. Um, some that are like, I've seen some that are just big as like Dark Souls levels, <laughs> like hu huge environments um, where you can navigate and, and go on like little adventures and stuff. And we never expected this uh, to happen at all, but our, our user base just kind of went wild with the concepts and, and found some some hidden code and, and, and changed some stuff and were able to access uh, assets that they weren't supposed to use, like dev assets, and just started like flipping shit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy. Anyways, um, the next staple of the product, apart from, you know, the virtual ecosystem of user generated content, which I was personally like in, in charge of like managing resident DJs and, and uh, maintaining steady stream of content uh, with our, our DJs was, was uh, one of my joys in life um, at the time, you know, letting these awesome creators um, be promoted through our channels and, and, and allow them to be promoted by me and, and wave and stuff. But we started working with uh, larger artists to create waves. So waves um, are basically specialized content, um, premium produced shows that live in the expanse, which is our social hub. Uh, well, some of them lived in the expanse and other ones were live, but um, ones like Enfold um, and Glitch Mob and, and Token Monsters, Loon Rouge, all lived in the product and, and were kind of like amusement park style uh, experiences where you can just experience them on a rolling basis whenever you want. Um, so th those pre-made shows, um, you know, are, are the content, the, you know, premium content that people can experience at any time. Um, eventually we moved to making premium one-off content and live shows that, uh, would be streamed out to other platforms as well, like Twitch and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Um, and that was kind of like the, uh, next step of how do we make this experience more premium and uh, more immersive for artists? And uh, while I could totally talk about this, I have a video here with my good friend T-Pain who will <laughs> explain exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> The majority of an artist's money used to come from uh, record sales. But now, the game has changed and touring is the main income of a lot of artists' pockets. And the business of touring is a fickle one. Making 60K in a day is freaking sweet, but being out on the road is real tough, man. Probably the hardest part about touring is just the, the shitty situations. You know, getting on three flights and a two hour drive to get to a city you never heard of. So what if I can bring the fans to me? A whole concert for that matter. That's why I'm here in LA to meet Adam Arrigo, the CEO of Wave XR. Wave XR creates virtual reality concerts for artists to perform for the fans pretty much anywhere. One of my main concerns is since I'm the kind of artist that feed off the energy of the crowd, I want to know if I'm going to be able to keep that same energy if it's just me in a VR headset in a virtual world in front of God knows who. I can perform butt naked with this though. Yeah, I'll lock the door. Nobody wants to walk in on that. Great to meet you, Matt. Same, same, same. We make a platform me. for creating, distributing, and monetizing <laughs> virtual concerts. Lit. So it's basically like a music festival online that never sleeps. Wow. Sounds demanding. It's a totally plug and play uh, setup for artists. You basically come in, put on this XN's mocap suit. We do real time facial tracking, body tracking, and we turn you to an avatar. What about the 
interaction part. When you're at the show, you have a number of equipables like glow sticks, you can right. spew butterflies from your hands, you can that create awesome. a hot tub around yourself. The DJ can be like, hey, let me see your hot tubs. And then the <laughs> entire audience creates an ocean of hot wow. tubs. Sounds a little crazy? Well, that's the point. WaveXR's goal is to team up with artists and brands to create super unique virtual experiences. Artists can be realistic versions of themselves, that's or their me. avatars can be anything they want. Imagine being able to experience that concert from anywhere in the world with all your friends and interact with the artists at the same time. We released our like sort of beta version of our app in 2017. So we spent the first couple years just trying to define like what's the format for a virtual concert and mm -hmm. what tech do we need to build. And we worked with some really great artists like Imogen Heap and we did this show with Steven Spielberg for the film Ready Player One. So fire. And, Such a uh, fire movie. We learned a lot about like what people want these virtual concerts mm -hmm. and ultimately how to get people to stay in the experience and come back. I think the Imogen and Glitch Mob shows we did had like a thousand people in VR, which wow. it's a good size yeah. show. The ability to throw a digital concert, doing something engaging and interactive to that scale of audience presents all kinds of new monetization opportunities. Sure. So sure. in-app purchases, brand sponsorships, and product placement and stuff. So there's many ways to bring in revenue off the whole platform. T-Pain tip. Intersection of markets means big money. If you see one industry making some money and you see another industry making some money, let's see what happens when you put those things together. Try some shit. All right, before I can step into the VR world, I gotta get fitted for my motion capture suit. Hips don't lie, guys. Come on now. I don't even know where my ankle is. <laughs> Damn, that got really in there. That was crazy. Ready to go? So, all right. Oh, we didn't get my size in this thing. <laughs> Everybody, um... I'm sorry, I don't know if I can zip this up on my own. This is for a child. <laughs> Coming up on T-Pain School of Business. Hell yeah, welcome to the Illuminati. Yeah! And later, I'll meet up with the car customization king. The team at Wave XR is literally hooking me up with motion capture sensors so I can perform as an avatar in my own virtual concert. And people all over the world can interact with me in real time. Let's see how dope this is. Uh, so yeah. This is a recreation of your most recent album. Absolutely. We basically just took the album cover, created the avatar based on that, created some artwork. Oh, yeah. So start over there. And walk in. Two, one, zero, turn around. And turning. Six. It's weird how much I'm paying attention four, to the walk right now. Three, just act natural. Two, one, zero, stop. Good. This is a fire. And man. now we are ready. All right, so next we're gonna hook up your face. Connected. That's all it took to turn you to a demon. All right! I am now a demon. Let's get some fire in here. Yeah! <laughs> so when we do these shows, we have artists come in, they put on this mocap suit, uh, and then you broadcast the show to millions of people. And this is a demo of how you would play a virtual concert. It's already fire. <laughs> That's you. This is cool as God damn it. <laughs> That's enough sweat for today. Something like this would take some serious funding. Like, what was the main resource there? We met some VC, and he's like, Yeah, you know, I'm looking for a DJ for my um, barbecue this weekend. Could you, like, just be the DJ? And we're like, wow. All right, maybe we'll be able to. I was that DJ. <laughs> I DJed that barbecue in VR. It was really weird, but we got like half a million dollars from that. So whatever. Meet some PCs that way. <laughs> yeah. And so we set up our VR DJ rig and we happened to meet a couple of amazing people that were like, hey, you could turn this into something bigger. What do you see the company 10 years in the future? We want to reinvent virtual entertainment. We think virtual concerts are going to be a multi-billion dollar industry in the, in the next few years. Huh. So if you think about the scale that a single show can hit, um, it's just far beyond what a normal concert could. So like that marshmallow show in Fortnite, for example, right, right. had it was a 10 or 11 million attendees at the same yeah, time, yeah. just from that 10 minute concert. Right. We think this is gonna be a, a totally new way for people to socialize around music. You're gonna have this new crop of talent that's 
hopefully being judged just based on mm. their talent and not where they're born or their race or gender or all the stuff that like represents the cards were dealt in reality. Right, right. That's so awesome, dude. Damn, deep right there. Quantum shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My takeaway from today is Wave XR has essentially found a way to innovate the way we interact with each other. It's gonna bring in fans of the music closer to the artist, as long as they can find their audience. Not leaving the house is a, is a pure bonus. Don't get me wrong now, Wave XR is not gonna completely replace real life touring, but it will or bring is it? <laughs> a community closer. And whether or not this whole thing takes off or not in music, there's definitely going to be a porn version, and that's going to make a billion dollars first week. Yeah. So, you know, if we're listening to T-Pain, the porn version is going to make a billion dollars in the first week, which is probably true. <laughs> Anyways, um, that's kind of it. Um, I can show you guys some other stuff, but uh, I just wanted to there's a few talking points here. Uh, we are in a crazy time and the next music industry disruption is right now. So it's more important than ever to, you know, be a part of the future and be a part of the people who are solving the problems that we're currently facing in the music industry. The main one being that live music is, is gone now, for probably for the next two years, at least. Um, and it's a completely, uh, you know, it's a huge game changer. If you guys don't know this, um, most artists make 75% of their income from live events and touring, um, myself included. Ah, um, so, you know, do what you can now to, um, you know, build your presence online, build your personal brand, um, use social media, connect with people, use Twitter, use Instagram, use Spotify and Twitch, use every resource you have now to you know, build and connect with people online because, you know, for the foreseeable future, this is how artists and people are going to be able to connect. Um, so, you know, you see it now every weekend. Now there's live stream Twitch virtual music festivals with 6,000 names, you know, on them who are all playing for free, uh, completely driving down the price of, you know, of, of what DJs are being paid and what musicians are being paid. So, you know, it it's could do more damage. I mean, it could do a lot of things. But, you know, the, the thing that we know is here to stay is virtual concerts are right now and they're happening right now. And it is the direction the music industry is heading. Um, and I was happy to help develop and build what that future is, even though I did not want it to hit as hard as it is right now. <laughs> um, Anyways, um, thank you guys a lot. Uh, I can answer any questions. Um, I know I didn't talk much about touring or being a rock star DJ or all that stuff, but I'm sure you guys know all about that stuff. I think this is the important thing to cover, so. Cool. Anybody have questions? Okay, I'll ask questions. I have plenty <laughs> questions. All um, right. This is a question that I've actually been um, wrestling with internally in our mm -hmm. own institution about live streaming concerts um, and kind of like mediating like what you sacrifice for quality in audio versus like what you gain from having the work happen in real time. And like one of the questions I have specifically for you is like, what is in and I, i'm not I, i'm not angling for any particular kind of answer like i genuinely just want to hear your perspective on this what do you think is the difference in terms of the experience like if i let's say i i i dj a live set to a, a chat room full of people and everyone's chatting and like participating how much of a difference is there for the user experience versus if i show a video that's slightly better produced in the virtual chat room with all the people there experiencing that video together and interacting with me while they watch that video. Like well, what do you think is like the, the, what part of the live experience do you think is like so essential that you can compromise on audio quality 
to maintain this kind of direct connection with an artist. Yeah, I, I think real time interaction with fans is super important. And um, Twitch people who are are big on Twitch and and have you know diehard fan bases are popular because they acknowledge their fans in real time and and talk to them and um, are able to to keep this line of communication over um, you know their entire live stream. I think um, you know a lot of events right now. A lot of these virtual music festivals that are happening in the past few weeks um, are using uh, content that's pre-recorded yeah. by an artist and then just playing it on the day of. And it, it, it does miss like a bit of a human element, you know. Um, something. I mean, Twitch culture is all about people subscribe to you because they want to hear their name said out loud. People give you a tip because they want you to read their comment. Um, yeah. People want attention from you yeah and you're there to give it to them um i don't think it completely diminishes from the experience if you're using like pre-recorded content and then interacting um like while the content is running yeah i, I mean it's similar um it just you know people really want to hear their name you know yeah. um so i, I think that's a yeah. terrible example but peloton app is a, another great example of that like mm -hmm. you could watch a workout video online, but it's so much more exciting if the person leading the class shouts shouts you out because you yeah. reached your goal, target, heart rate, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, I mean, interaction like that is is why people like personal trainers are are used all the time, and you know, mm -hmm. or, or therapists or you know anything like that where you're interacting the real person. I mean, people just want human connection, and we're we're in a time now where. Um, people are kind of starved for for attention from other people um, because you know, we're disconnected. Um, there is this, um, I forget her name. I was really obsessed with her music in my early 20s. She's like an Egyptian diva. She's like the Aretha Franklin of like recorded music in the 50s and 60s mm -hmm. in Egypt. And like the art form was like the, the way that the, the, the performance would unfold, like the form of the piece essentially. Like if she would repeat something, if she would cue the orchestra to come in, if she would like change keys or whatever, it was all dictated by the audience. And there was this like really weird push and pull between this collective body of the audience and then this singular artist, which I think is also like very relevant with the kind of like DJ music and culture that you have participated in. And I'm wondering for our students, like, how do you think that that translates to the kind of work that you're doing right now? And how much do you want your work to be mediated by like a collective body of users versus having, um, you know, more, more control over, you know, how the music is ultimately presented and looked back upon? I mean, I've always taken uh, a live show being just that you can't like prepare for the things you're gonna experience on a stage or on a live stream um and i think rolling with the show as it goes is is a really important part of of being live you know I, i've been a part of um like for example i was part of this show with twitch studios called fresh stock where um every week we'd have a random celebrity guest on the show right and one time we had Andy Milnakis and he showed up wasted at 10 a.m. and was <laughs> was a terrible person and it was just like saying a bunch of crazy shit and like degrading stuff about women and, and it was like we're just like okay we have to roll with this and I don't know how it's gonna work but you know that, that's part of that's part of the live setting right like having that unknown factor and, and having um, that unpolished bit to it but the important thing is it, it's live it's happening in real time and you're able to you know, interact with people and, and interact with the chat and interact with live news coming on. I mean, you know, uh, broadcasts are, you know, they've been around for a long time, obviously, like the news is always going live and, and stuff and, and they're always rolling with punches. It's just, there's a certain element uh, to that, that that feels more human than, than produced content and um, having, you know, more control. Mm -hmm. Um, do you see a lot of parallels in your music? Like how much as an artist, are you open to like having your music sort of um, sharing your vision and, uh, and, and your like creative control with an audience that might be um, like eventually I imagine mediating 
like the work, like a picking a baseline or um, choosing between, you know, chord progressions, like kind of seems like everything was moving in this direction. Um, and I'm curious, especially in gaming and app development, like meta Ableton kind of choosing various parts of a, a work of art, how much as an artist, are you seeking that from your audience versus controlling um, your statement as like an independent individual artist, composer? Um, well, I definitely try to create a narrative and create a story surrounding my music personally and, and my music releases. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's up to the audience to kind of decipher that. But I think I've done a pretty good job in, um, you know, I've been working on an album for a while, which is re releasing this year. And um, I'm trying to, you know, tell people this is about, you know, rediscovering my love for music. It's about, you know, using all of my uh, talents, playing guitar, singing, blah, blah, using technology, um, but combining into a package that's like uh, reminiscent of, of the early 2000s uh, era of video games and those kind of sounds. At the end of the day, it, it is up to the listener and it's up to the person consuming the content to, you know, kind of get those messages mm -hmm. and, and see that vision. Um, of course, I'm going to support that vision that I have with everything um, possible. Um, I actually I totally forgot to show this thing. <laughs> Speaking of that thing. So um, I have been releasing music and I'm compiling that music on this website which um, is trying to convey the, the vision, which is that all the music is kind of from this, I mean, the album's called Era, right? And, and it's because uh, all my sound design and everything is, is uh, referencing this era of games. So um, I've worked on this website that uh, if anyone recognizes what this is from, it's, it's from the PlayStation 2. Um, so anyways, I'm just gonna play this uh because i forgot to show it because this is kind of the latest thing I'm, that's work in progress works better on your phone also <laughs> Thank you. 
Anyways, that's all in real time. Um, so once that website launches, you'll be able to have fun, play with it on your phone, and uh, you know, experience my album in a cool way that's kind of reminiscent of uh, graphics and stuff from the PlayStation 2 era. Um, but yeah, developing things that are um, in spirit with the vision and, and, and message and story I'm, I'm trying to tell are, are, is really important. But yeah, at the end of the day, it is up to um, the listener and the person experience and the fan to uh, take what they want out of that. But from the way I'm, I've branded this project, it's pretty clear. Um, it's like PlayStation or <laughs> Final Fantasy VII or whatever. Um, Clark, your um, projects have a very visual element to them. It seems like a lot of them, you know, um, I, I'm, not, I'm it, I mean, you've definitely had a had a background doing actually graphic design and in games. Do you design all of your 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 entire visual um, uh, like backgrounds and like do you yeah. do the code as well for for these kinds of uh, presentations? Uh, I do all of my own 3D art um, and creative direction. Uh, coding, I'm not the strongest coder. I worked with uh, Nick Shelton, who is uh, my VJ and uh, also the technical art director of Wave um, on this. Um, and you know, we're still working on it. There's <laughs> quite a bit left to do, but uh, we're you know we have a good start. Um, but yeah, I, I've done all of my own graphics, all of my own visuals, all of my own branding, marketing, etc. Um, throughout the years. And, you know, that's actually a pretty important point and important thing to uh, uh, keep in mind. Uh, as a musician and artist in, you know, this time, it's kind of on you to, to be an expert at many more things than just music. Um, and just being you know amazing producer amazing dj is just not enough to to make it you need to stand out you need to you know you need to master social media you need to master branding you need to master all these things that going into it you kind of like you learn as you go and you know i've, I've learned over the past 20 years of, of playing in bands and, and marketing different projects and and making music that it you know just the music isn't enough in fact like music is is doesn't it barely even matters like everything surrounding the music is almost more important than than that's product exactly, itself that's exactly kind of like where one of the the tangents when i was asking you <laughs> exactly that is just when a work of art becomes so interactive and when digital content becomes so easy to um appropriate and reappropriate and share like the the brand and the concept is kind of the only thing that that you can truly own as 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 an artist because everything is becoming um recyclable in a way and not not in a bad way but like very much to your point like uh the audience is no longer just like a passive being that's going to sit there and just consume, yeah. consume something yeah you, you really have to hook them you really have to um you know give people a reason to come back give people a reason to follow you I mean, 40,000 songs are released today, basically, and getting your song to matter is near impossible. I mean, at the end of the day, the music industry, um, in terms of releasing music and the record industry, it's a pay to play game. Like, you need to pay to get seen, you need to get pay to get heard. And if you're not doing that, um, I mean, I personally don't put a lot of money into marketing stuff. I, I try to create a, you know, a product and a full vision that markets itself or, you know, is shared by influencers and stuff. Um, or is, you know, engaged by the gaming community. Obviously, like my fan base is largely made of um, people that like video games. And, you know, I've spent a lot of my career remixing video game music and publishing video game music. Um, so I, I know my audience and I know what they want. And I know, you know, to some degree how to bring in new people that like those things but haven't heard of me yet. But uh, yeah, the full package is, is, is so important and, you know, it, you can have an amazing song. You can have an amazing, uh, beautiful, amazing, like this should be the biggest song in the world, right? But uh, if you don't have the full uh, vision behind it, like it's, it's going to fall flat and it's depressing. And it's, it's really, it sucks. It, it sucks a lot when, when you put a lot of time into making music and, and building a career out for yourself and 
it doesn't hit as hard as you wish it does but it's not that first song or that second song or that third song or even that tenth song that's going to make it it's gonna be that hundredth song and it's going to be random because some person on tiktok uses it and makes a stupid dance <laughs> and you know it it's you just got to keep doing it you have to keep producing content you have to keep doing stuff on a schedule you need to connect with your fans you need to um keep the people uh who are supporting you and your music close and and know who they are and, and cater to what those people like and, and want while still you know accomplishing your vision Speaking of uh, keeping it relevant, um, Clark, I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about your recent uh, work inside the realm of Animal Crossing. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've mentioned Animal Crossing many times. Uh, so lately, uh, I've been throwing raves in Animal Crossing and streaming them live on Twitch. Um, and I guess I can pull up a VOD. I totally forgot I was going to talk about this. Um, So I always tell people I can make a virtual concert on anything. Um, and, you know, when Animal Crossing was first announced, I thought it would be awesome to uh, make my island into a music festival and pro shows. So ever since it released, I've been doing that. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. And my cat has woken up. And it's going to join the call really soon. Okay, let's see. Um, share screen. Um, yeah, so I'm actually live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on twitch.tv slash grimecrab doing this now. Um, but yeah, I'm getting some stutter. Oh, that is... Got a little... So basically I built virtual green screens so I can VJ and DJ at the same time in Animal Crossing and create a really cool looking compelling experience that is uh, close to what a real life show is. Um, you know, I, I've had interviews with Forbes and Kotaku and a bunch of different outlets about this concept and creating these kind of virtual concerts. I think a lot of people that like saw me doing this um, didn't really um, understand that I have a pretty extensive history in, in doing this kind of thing and, and uh, expertise in, in throwing virtual concerts. But, uh, you know, made it work. And I think, you know, the results, you know, look good. Um, and the monetization for myself has been great. Like I, I've never seen this many subscribers on my channel. I've never seen, um, this much income produced by Twitch in my life. And so I'm going to keep doing it, keep improving on it, keep making, uh, something compelling that, that people like, and, you know, I've, I have a great community of, of people on Twitch who, um, really in, enjoy this and are meeting new friends and, you know, hanging out with each other. And that's the kind of thing I want to build a community of, of, of people who love music and, and love video games. Um, and, you know, Animal Crossing really came at the right time uh, with us all being stuck inside. And it's uh, been really, really fun to um, do this kind of thing. And so this is a scenario where the that your the participants are actually interacting with you online on Twitch, but they're also interacting with you in the game itself separately. Yes, correct. I mean that's like pretty pretty mind boggling because they're on like two screens at this point, yeah. interacting <laughs> with each other. You're interacting with them, and they. It, I, th I think it's a really awesome concept. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm, I've really been enjoying building it out and, and improving upon it every week um and yeah helping people connect with each other and, and helping people uh, bond over over music um, yeah so if you guys are ever free on tuesday come to one of my raves in animal crossing <laughs> they're lit i swear <laughs> they're super fun um and you know i play good music and there's a lot of good people in chat and you'll have a good time like who are some of your major influences like musically uh musically um 
I think my biggest influence, uh, Rusty, um, is a producer out of Glasgow, um, Hudson Mohawk, of course, uh, Skrillex, um, Coheed and Cambria, um, a bunch of rock and emo bands, MCR, My Chemical Romance. Um, I don't know. I, I have a lot of like rock roots in my electronic music and uh, a lot of people call me out on that and that's fine. It's like, oh, well, yeah, I, I was raised by like rock music. Like I was touring in rock bands before EDM um, and it, it's part of who I am. And, and, you know, that's the kind of... Um, you know, I'm drawing those influences. I, I'm a musician. I, I am a guitar player. I'm a drummer. I'm a bass player. Um, and I, I mean, I, I didn't even really get into electronic music until I moved to Los Angeles in, in 2010 and um, went to Low End Theory and saw Tom York and uh, Flying Lotus DJ set um, of the craziest beats I ever heard. Um, and I was like, wow, like this is this is next level. Like this is so cool and at that point you know i got really into it and, and um started making beats and um doing doing that kind of thing my cat is has joined the party you know i feel like i don't know exactly how old you are but i too am like a, ch um, a child yeah. in my space era yeah <laughs> i mean i'm 30 so yes <laughs> i feel like this was like the first time where marketing and um, content production became like a seriously important organizing principle and how people were conceiving, how they were constructing. Oh God, hold up. My cat unplugged my headphones and I can't hear you just for a second. Okay, continue, <laughs> sorry. No, I'm just saying like for our students, many of them, you know, this is something we talk about in class. In, in, when they first come to, to school is like they have grown up in an era where music wasn't made in a tactile way yeah. like they never made that tra transition from like oh this is a, a guitar and it plugs into an amp and there's pedal board and yeah those kind of tactile parallels uh -oh, the, the dog and the cat are talking to each other hold on let me her. come here uh, do, do any students have uh, any questions for Clark? Yeah, I have a question actually about um, Wave and how were there any uh, performers that ever performed with acoustic instruments um, on Wave and how like would that work? If yes, they did? Um, the answer is yes. Actually, I should pull up a video. Um, if my cat would get off my lap and okay <laughs> um yeah so we had lindsey sterling um do a show uh is my screen still being shared no i'm sharing something else Hold on. um so yeah we had lindsey sterling and she's actually the only musician with an acoustic instrument we had on the show but she played an electric violin um oh god vimeo <sighs> I'll show you that that uh, video and show you how that worked. That was actually one of the coolest um, concerts we did with Wave, and and also one of the most well attended. Lindsay um, has one of the most dedicated fan bases out of any musician I've ever met, um, and she's also like really wholesome and slightly Christian and weird, but like mostly really wholesome. Um, okay, I have the video now. Yeah, we had to track her um, yeah, that's, violin that's also. That's how I move. That is, that's me performing. And I got to experience it with people around the world to feel their energy even from a virtual screen was really cool. It was just really fun to bring 
this world to life with ideas and things that could never happen in a practical, real show. I love that you guys are showing up as stars. That's right, you guys are all like glowing right now. And France is here, hello France. I love New York, I'll be there soon. We are all Artemis. We all can bring light to darkness. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, it was a technical challenge for sure. Um, and doing that with multiple instruments, um, is not something we're close to yet. I mean, the closest thing to multiple instruments was Galantis had, um, two sets of drums, which actually broke one of the sensors in their hand and, and the show kind of got ruined, but <laughs> we cut creatively in the live camera. So you never saw that his avatar was T-posed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's possible. It's technically challenging to, to put real instruments um, into virtual reality. I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, since you deal with a lot of video game material, uh, have you ever had any hiccups where you've run into like legal issues from main factor from distributors or video game companies? No, um, that's because I so I work with a label called Game Shops, and we do mechanical licensing for our remixes of video game music. Um, so every song I have that's like a remix of a video game is cleared, um, and the developers of those games are getting royalties from my song as well. So no, never never encountered that problem. But a lot of people obviously have because they don't know about the label or don't know that mechanical licensing, which is usually used for like cover songs, can can also be used um, to remix video game music. Uh, I had one more question, just kind of out of left field. Um, so, what do you think is the percentage of like music tour versus technology in your like everyday? Like, how much time do you spend making music versus how much time do you spend, you know, behind the scenes working on computers? Uh, well, all of it involves working on a computer all day, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now my entire year's schedule of music releases is scheduled. Like, uh, my album is done and I'm pushing out music and mostly focusing on creating art assets and creating marketing strategies and um, supporting those releases with content. Um, so yeah, right now, uh, not a lot of my time is being uh, spent making music, but more producing content, which at the end of the day, as a music producer in 2020, you're actually just a content creator and you need to make as much content as possible to support the music. <laughs> Any other questions? Anybody pop in? Where where do you so like Coke Coke music? Uh, I I actually wasn't around to play it, but it looks amazing. Where you know where are the Coke music aspects of Animal Crossing, or where do you? Th why do you think we don't have something so? I guess at least such a like a power as powerful as a music tool in these kinds of metaverse environments. Dude, I don't know. <laughs> I wish, again, if it still existed to this day, I'd be using it. Um, and, you know, Wave was the you know, closest attempt I had to, to making something similar or like an advanced version of that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And, you know, I think that concept, the entire concept, if you study it, it's a gold mine. It is something that if someone made a new version of that right now, it'd be super duper successful. And maybe that's what my next project is, like remaking Coke music for 2020, but not in VR. <laughs> um, I mean, that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, Animal Crossing has, has similar elements to that. Uh, you know, obviously building your home and stuff. Uh, but yeah, no one, no one has ever pulled off something like that. Like the, the in-game DAW 
and sharing music and the upvotes will get you money and the downvotes will get your song skipped and you use that money to fund your studio and you make a cool studio and people will come and give you more upvotes and what an awesome economy and what an awesome concept that um project was actually driven to the ground when it was acquired by a different company making a 3d version of it basically um i think it was called next or something it was called something stupid that lasted for two years but they basically pushed all their users to this 3d platform that looked like shit and um never caught on because the branding sucked and the product was you know not superior early 3d from early real-time 3d from from 2000s looked like shit and people just weren't ready to make that leap and it, it's such a sad story of like something that was so amazing and and worked just the way it was at, at the right time um and you know i hope i hope something like that can be made and if anyone in this chat <laughs> wants to make something like that <laughs> Hit me up because <laughs> I would totally join that project. Yeah, if someone came to me and was like, hey, we're at our Series A of funding. We just got, you know, $40 million and we want to bring you on as creative director for Coke Music 2. I would be like, hell yeah. I know I would do this. I, I you know, I hope someone out there <laughs> can like put this, this energy into the world and, and have that happen. You know, right now, just get a call from Coca-Cola and... That'd be cool. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's, it's, uh, someone will do it. Did, did you ever, uh, have you thought about like doing performances on Fortnite or like, did you ever do anything in Second Life? I'm wondering what some of these other, like, you know, venues that you've, that you've pursued out there oh, are. So, um, in college, I was doing like Minecraft, um, parties and, uh, I've used, uh, Second Life. I've used, um, what is it? Um, the people that made Second Life have a new product um, that is struggling. What's it called? Samsar. Um, God, I have to think. I mean, Fortnite, uh, that experience really only works when they work directly with someone um, and, you know, do kind of like what we do with Waves, like the, the branded content. Um, but yeah, I mean, right now it's Animal Crossing. That's the wave. It's the perfect environment. It's the, you know, it's got all the right systems. It's got the right amount of customization. It's an enjoyable experience for everybody. I think it's kind of like the best platform for, for, for doing something like this right now, aside from like Minecraft, but, or Roblox or, or something. But, you know, I've been there, done that. That shit's been out for a long time. Um, I want to do something different. Um, yeah. Actually, I ha I've had a bunch of people reach out to me in the past two weeks about throwing a large vessel using my system. Um, and uh, based on the technical hurdles I've, I've had, it's like, I want to do this. It's just, you know, right now it's not really feasible. I need like, you know, more RAM <laughs> And uh, I need a second switch and I need to be able to develop a system that makes it so I can fill out rooms. And, you know, it, doing this kind of thing is even harder when we're all isolated. Like if I had a second person that wasn't my cat, I could easily like, you know, feasibly do bigger things with, with the um, platform I've been building in, in Animal Crossing. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, the future is looking good and, and um, the potential partners to work with on, on building out a new kind of virtual concert are uh, are interesting to me and, and I think will will be a hit. I mean, it's already a hit, but like bigger scale hit. <laughs> so I have a question about um, Animal Crossing. How do you get audio into, like how do you get audio into Animal Crossing to get to play for other people? So it's all, it's a little deceptive, but it's all just running through um, Streamlabs OBS and the audio is, is uh, streamed to um, Twitch directly. Um, you can't port your own audio into Animal Crossing, unfortunately, which would make for a really cool experience. But I mean, it's, it's being done the same way that people are doing Minecraft concerts, which the audio is a separate music stream that people um, run side by side with it. Um, if there's, a, you know, a platform where you could have your own audio um, imported. I, I think that would be even better. Um.
Um, and, and really cool. And maybe, you know, Coke Music 2.0 that we're all going to build um, will have that capability. <laughs> so keep these ideas in mind when, when you are trying to build a new product or, um, you know, build some kind of product that's going to intersect these markets. These are all good things to think of. So Let's all I got pull a, 40 million. <laughs> nice. Go on. I got hey. an important question for you. Okay. Uh, what is the best video game soundtrack? Uh, Final Fantasy VII. Nobuo Matsu. Like, straight up. I mean, uh, yeah. Like, <laughs> not a question in my mind. I just think of that immediately. Um, I mean, there's other great ones too. Um, Koji Kondo, you know, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. Um, Super Mario 64. There's tons of great music. Um, I love that era of music and the constraints that were used uh, to create those sounds. And a lot of my um, sound design is used um, is using those sounds. Um, I most of my synth production is done with sound fonts that I heavily process to make something that's a little more palatable for um, <laughs> modern users' ears. Uh, but yeah, I. I I think Final Fantasy VII hands down has the best music of any game ever. I have a question. Hey. Um, do, do games ever like inspire like the music that you make? Just by um, them? Yeah, they 100 percent inspire all the music I make. Well, like, I mean, I mean, like what, like, like what games? I mean, like Minecraft, but like what games have inspired like your sounds the most? Like, is it the visuals of the games that inspire? Uh, no, it's it's a lot of the sounds. Um, yeah, um, and you know, the album I'm working on is uh, the antithesis of of all those things. The late 2000s or late 90s and early 2000s era of video game music um, is is kind of like what inspires me most. Like those sounds from from like Final Fantasy VII and and stuff off the Dreamcast and, and Nintendo 64 and, and those like kind of like lo-fi uh sounds like at post chip tune, you know? Um I think those are uh, some of the most like iconic sounds that is is seen and, and heard in, in most of my music. I'm I'm always drawing inspiration from those games and, and those times and uh yeah so and I think my entire life has been um inspired by video games i mean i don't know many other people who have somehow made uh video games and music into a really weird career that has somehow worked out <laughs> so. Do you think that's like what um like i guess what a lot of your listeners are drawn to is that sort of nostalgia yes absolutely one thousand percent that's in you know i am consistently milking that that's I mean that that's what keeps me going too. Like uh, the Final Fantasy VII remake just came out last weekend, and um, you know that's also when I dropped my latest single, which is you know about Final Fantasy VII. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm, that's that's one hundred percent it. And I know, know my niche market, and I know uh, that is you know why I get bookings. It's you know why I. I'm usually booked for shows surrounding E3 and, and video game industry stuff. And, you know, vi video games and music, I've combining those things it was my dream. Like those are my two interests in life. I grew up on a farm in uh, nowhere ass Virginia. And <laughs> the thing that kept me sane was video games. And the thing that I knew would get me out of there was music. So I plugged in my guitar and my Super Nintendo and found a way <laughs> um yeah a, a, a lot of times actually people lump me into chiptune which is an entirely different thing but um yeah video game music is is it has inspired everything would you ever like write music or have you ever written music for video games i have I yes. you have yeah i'm pretty I read that. yes <laughs> yeah um yeah but uh honestly i don't have like composing for music um, for games much it do you feels... approach it a lot differently from just the music that you write yeah like... uh, well yeah my written music original music is like bangers <laughs> you know like club music and uh writing for games is you know a loop 
a specific kind of loop that fulfills a purpose um, and has various narrative or um, mood uh, goals that you need to accomplish and usually working for someone else. And, you know, I hate working for someone else. <laughs> I, you know, I want to do what I want to do. Um, and I've been given that freedom before. I got to work on a game called um, Agents of Mayhem uh, in like 2015, which is a, it was the sequel or spiritual successor to uh, Saints Row, if you've ever heard that game. But basically um, I got to work with uh, this, there's a character in the game that's supposed to be like Justin Bieber. So um, <laughs> I got to write like his music and a bunch of like, kind of like, Future bass. I basically wrote a bunch of future bass music, and uh, it was super fun, and it, it was authentic. And at the end of the day, I, I actually own the rights for that music too. So if I wanted to distribute it um, myself as Grimecraft, I could, but I, I didn't end up doing that because you know the songs were kind of short and, and meant for the game, and you know I don't know, <laughs> it wasn't for me. But it was a really you know that's a rare deal to like be like, hey, you can make this music, it'll be used for promotion, and you get to keep the rights for it. Like that's like almost unheard. Of. So, um, yeah, definitely usually a different approach, except for that one project. Cool. Uh, you want to say you appreciate the fat Pikachu back there? Yes. Clark, what, what are some of the <laughs> most um, essential tools that you've that you've used? I guess they could be musical or non-musical, the things that you rely on or have just really come to love uh, working in this field? Um, I'm a big supporter of creative stimulants. Um, <laughs> take that how you will. Um, but uh, anything that helps drive creativity, um, which, you know, gaming is included in that. Uh, I think having the chance to relax and play games really helps um, drive creativity. Uh, a tool I use um, a lot for concepting various stuff is the Unreal Engine. Um, obviously, you know, with my history in, in video games and uh, developing video games, uh, I'm pretty keen on creating stuff with real-time engines. Um, a lot of my art and rendered art and um, things I've, I've made, I've, you know, put in a real-time environment in Unreal and that really helps me like come up with with uh, like ideas and, and help me like visualize things and, and stuff. I mean, just having like art stuff open. I always have Photoshop open. I always have a synthesizer on. I always have my drum kit on. Just having toys to play with um, is you know really good for my creative process. Um, and be able to like obsess over <laughs> stuff like when I get obsessed with like my live stream and, and just stay up all night, like working on it and making visuals and mapping my controllers and you know, like, oh, this is gonna be really cool. Uh, just like letting myself kind of flow into that weird manic state of creation. Um, it's really important. And, you know, I, I would say, yeah, having things around you that creatively stimulate you is really important and being able to um, always be able to like go into creative mode when it strikes. There's no clock um for creativity like there, there's i always find like it's at 3 a.m that i come up with the best ideas and then i just stay up all night um and you know ha being surrounded by things i'm comfortable with and, and things that allow me to to create is is super important also marijuana dude <laughs> um straight up um uh what a excellent thing it's legal in california for a reason if you're ever 21 um you can check that out. <laughs> Other uh, questions from the class? Cool. Well, um, Clark, thanks so much for uh, sharing your wisdom with our, our students today. Um, it's been uh, such a such a, a relevant lecture for the, the state that the world is in. I, I think we're all really interested to see you know, since you're kind of like pioneering this field to see where where you take it, um, and kind of uh, ourselves trying to figure out where 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 we're all going to go with it as individual artists. Yeah, I'm super um, interested and terrified to see where it goes. So um, I hope you guys 
all have been inspired in some way and and you know you guys are the future so um think about the challenges we're facing today and and you know approach your music and approach your career in that way like how can you help the music industry evolve and that was a question i've asked myself all the time um and i think you know at least a little bit accomplished some way to to push forward the super antiquated music industry <laughs> Cool. Well, um, thanks for everybody who has uh, been watching and, and following along uh, online. Um, next week, we'll have uh, Will Roger, who's a game composer, visiting. But um, yeah, I just want to give a huge thanks to uh, yeah, Clark. Clark. Yeah. Thank you.